For Crema Media's Polity, I'm Chanel De Bruyne. I'm with well-known political commentator Mwaleti Mbeki to discuss his new book, Advocates for Change, How to Overcome Africa's Challenges. Mwaleti, the new book is a follow-up on your previous book, Architects of Poverty, in which you looked at the challenges facing Africa. This time you look at the solutions to these challenges. How did this book come about and what is the biggest message that you want to convey? Well, uh, Architects of Poverty uh, surprised especially myself, but also the publisher, which is Penn Macmillan, uh, in that the book did extremely well. Uh, we, had it, we checked a few weeks ago, and the book is now a, a number one political seller in South Africa. It sold more than 27,000 copies uh, in the last two years since it was released. So we realize that there is a huge demand in the South African market for books that try to address the reality of South Africa and of Africa rather than a lot of the wishful thinking, frankly, that gets done by the likes of the World Bank and McKinsey and all these other people who write about Africa and are uh, not giving us the, the reality about the real situation in Africa. So the, the, the readers in South Africa and in Africa want to hear what are the real problems. Uh, and so we felt that they also want to hear what are the real solutions. So that's why we, the publisher and myself then felt that we should uh, do a follow-up book that addresses the solutions to, to, to the problems that we identified in Architects of Poverty. So that's what, where this book came about. However, I don't have the solutions myself to Africa's many, many, many problems. So I selected a number of uh, people who I felt had the expertise to address uh, the issues that are there. Um, so that's how the book came about. So we have 11 contributors in the book, six from South Africa, uh, five from uh, other African countries, uh, and I write the introduction and I'm the editor. So that's how uh, this whole process came about. And what is the main message or the biggest message that you hope to convey with this book? Well, the message that uh, we set out to convey with the book was that there are solutions to the problems, but you have to face the problems straight. If you don't face the problems straight, if you don't identify the problems uh, in their totality, and you identify bits and pieces, you whitewash this bit and you whitewash the other bit, uh, then you will never come to a solution. So that was the spirit with which we approached uh, the, the writing of, the, of, of, uh, of this book. And that was the spirit of all the authors. The, the authors, the 11 authors, are extremely distinguished uh, analysts, academics, uh, experts on African issues, and they are all Africans. So that was one of the things which we, had, we are very proud about this book, is that this is a book that is produced by Africans who spend day and night in Africa, finding the solutions, living the problems, living with the problems themselves. Uh, so that's what we, we, we were very pleased about. Uh, one of the things we're pleased in connection with this book. Who are you hoping will take note of these suggested solutions? Well, really the book, although the book is aimed at everybody who lives in Africa. Uh, so it's not written for specialists, it's not written for governments, it's written all of us who live in Africa, making our countries perform to meet the expectations of all of us is a challenge for everybody. You are no more safe from crime than I am, than the person living in the informal settlement in Deep Slot. We all live in that danger. All of us are faced with, for example, road accidents. Whether you travel in your expensive car or you travel in a taxi, you can be killed just like that in a road accident. 
So these are the issues that I identify the book, in the book, and these are the issues that face all African people are faced with, with, with these problems, and therefore they themselves have to understand what the solutions are to these problems, and then do what they can in their, within their means to, to try and help address this, uh, to implement these solutions. What insight can we gain in terms of health and education? Well, let me start with the, with the chapter on, uh, on health. Uh, the chapter on health is written by Helen Rees uh, and Francois Fenter, who are really world-class experts on uh, HIV AIDS, uh, on reproductive health issues. Uh, so what they, they are addressing the issue of declining life expectancy in Africa. Uh, and this is the case. In South Africa, for example, our life expectancy has fallen from mid-60s uh, in terms of life expectancy. We are now in some way in the mid-50s. So we're having a declining. So they identify all the factors that contribute to falling life expectancy. And, and frankly, I was very surprised when I read their manuscript about how many things lead to a huge number of deaths in Africa. We all think of HIV AIDS, but there is TB, there is malaria, there are road accidents. Huge number of people are killed in road accidents in Africa. Um, there's crime, huge number, especially of young people, young men are, are killed in violent crime. So these are all the factors that uh, we have to understand contribute to the decline in life expectancy. And then there's water management, there's sewage management, there's a multitude of factors that are leading to the declining expectancy, life expectancy. So those are all the issues that need to be addressed, uh, to, that need to be solved. Uh, on the education side, well, this is uh, a chapter by Professor Jonathan Johnson, who is uh, the Vice Chancellor of the University of the Free State. It's an enormously powerful chapter also about the state of chaos, especially in the black schools in South Africa. You would have expected that a black government, which the ANC prides itself of being, would put its priority in the education of the black population. But frankly, as far as I can make out, it's, a, it's an issue of passing interest to them. Uh, and it's a real shock and it's a real scandal. And Professor Johnson brings that out very, very well. The unions, the trade unions that are involved, that, that have organized the teachers, are also involved uh, in this huge underperformance of our education sector. And Johnson doesn't pull any punches when he addresses the unions that they also have to uh, pull their socks up. If I can quote Zuelin Zimavavi, last week he told uh, President Zuma to pull to pull his socks up, well, his own union members have to pull their socks up uh, who are in the education sector to make sure that the children get the, the education that they deserve. There is no future for this country or for Africa if our populations are not getting the education that is as good as the education that the Americans get, that the Chinese get, that the Singaporeans get, that the Japanese get. Our education has to be as good as that, otherwise we're going nowhere. The Secretary General of Comesa also stresses the importance of speeding up regional integration now. Why is this so important right now? Well, Africa has small countries. This is the legacy we inherited from colonialism. We have these small countries with small markets. South Africa would not fit even in one province in China or in India. So for us to think we can compete against blocks like the European Union, against huge countries like the United States, which has 300 million people, let alone India with 1 billion people, China with 1.3 billion, we're fooling ourselves. You can't compete with these tiny little populations that we have in Africa. So you have to create integrated markets so that we can then, we have regions that have the critical mass in population terms 
to be able to, de to develop their own industries. Because without a home market, without a large domestic market, you can't develop uh, industries. So you have to create a large domestic market, which is the regi what regional integration is about. And then you will be in a comp position to compete with this huge country. I mean, Indonesia has more than 200 million people, and it's a collection of islands. So, so the Africans thinking that little Swaziland, which has less than a million people, really can compete against China with 1.3 billion people is just a fool's paradise. Your book also highlights Mauritius as a success story. What can other African countries learn from them? Well, my, the, the chapter on Mauritius is really fascinating. I recommend any, everyone in Africa to read the chapter on Mauritius. Here is the small island of uh, a little over a million people. When the British colonialists left, it was all that Mauritius grew was sugar, all that they exported was sugar, and the people were dead poor. Between 1968 and today, Mauritius has overtaken South Africa on a per capita income basis in, as, as the richest country uh, in Africa. Uh, the richest non-oil producing country in Africa is, is Mauritius. And it is just hard work. It is belief in themselves, taking advantages of the opportunities that they saw. Just to give you an example, Mauritius took advantage of the sugar, of the preference sugar agreement that as a Commonwealth member they had preferential access to the UK. And then that got expanded into the European Union. They took advantage of that as well. Then they, they realized, let's go into clothing. And there was something called the multi-fiber arrangement, which then gave them advantage into, of entry into the United States market and so on. So they built up a huge textile industry. Uh, the author of the chapter told me that Mauritius doesn't know what a cotton plant looks like, but they are the biggest exporters of cotton clothing from Africa because they developed the manufacturing side, the clothing textile, and then the clothing them, uh, themselves. So they kept looking where are the opportunities and they took advantage of those opportunities. I was in, in Mauritius a few months ago and I visited a call center where they've now moved onto call centers because Mauritius is a bilanguage country. They speak French and in English and English. So they use the skills of the metric students to run call centers and to work in call centers. And these kids, literally, you could see hundreds of them. And they use the money they make out of the call centers to pay for their university education. Many of them study in South African universities and they pay for themselves. So it's, a, it's the creativity of the people, it's the creativity of the leadership. That's why we felt this chapter is a very critical chapter for the book so that people realize African countries can succeed. We're not just thinking of pie in the sky or just dreaming. We have examples of countries that have succeeded uh, we, and, and Mauritius is that example. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure. Donate now and give 15 rand a month. SMS JOIN to 41486.